Welcome to another presentation. May I remind you that a PDF version is available by following the link on the YouTube page. This one is entitled Who are the Parents of Edward de Vere's Son? Now this may seem to you to be a very strange question. Others may be thinking, well he had more than one. Quite true, there were three, possibly four if you include Henry Rosalie. The first was a product of a relationship with Anne Vavasor, who was a lady of the bedchamber to the Queen, and famously went into labour on the 23rd of March 1581 at the Palace of Westminster. She was banished from court and had a spell in the tower for her trouble, along with the father, Edward de Vere. This son was Edward Vere. Following his birth, there was a running battle between Anne Vavasor's family, led by her uncle, Thomas Nivett, and the Earl of Oxford. Both men were injured in the affray, and at least two others lost their lives. The young Edward was brought up by his mother and her lover, Sir Henry Lee, the Queen's former master of the armouries. Edward took no part in his son's life, apart from gifting £2,000 to Anne and settling some lands on his son. The young Edward, later to be Sir Edward Vere, was a protégé of Edward de Vere's cousin Horatio. He's shown here in 1618, interestingly sporting a sling. He was both a soldier and a scholar, spending his summer fighting in the Netherlands and in the winter working in his study. There is no record of his father's involvement in his life. So there's no doubt about the parenthood here then. On the 6th of May, 1583, 18 months after the reconciliation of Edward and his wife Anne, their only son was born, but died two days after birth. The infant was buried at Castle Headingham three days after the birth on the 9th of May, 1583. And there's no doubt about that one either. The third son was Henry de Vere, born on the 24th of February 1593, and this is the one we'll be looking at. As I'm sure you're aware, there's often a mix-up over dates, as the new year began on Lady Day, the 25th of March. You can see from the extract, taken from John Norden's Mirrors of the British, which confirms the birth date. Henry Viscount Bulbeck, son to the Right Honourable Edward de Vere, born on the 24th of February 1592, equals 24th of February 1593. Details from the Parish Church of St Mary confirm the birth date and the baptism date of the 31st of March 1593. The official story is that he was the son of Edward de Vere and his wife Elizabeth Trentham, whom he married in late 1591. Now what's the problem with that, you might ask? Well, there are several pieces of evidence which raise doubt about it. We're going to explore some of this evidence, and then we will look at several scenarios which have been suggested and tie these down to the known movements and availability of the various people in question. Now, there's good evidence of a vulgar scandal that derailed Edward de Vere's life in the early 1590s. There is also good evidence from the sonnets of a love triangle between Edward de Vere, Henry Rosalie and the so-called Dark Lady. Contemporary literature, including Venus and Adonis and Lucrece, point to some rather strange events. From a book entitled Willoughby His Avisa, we learn of someone being cuckolded. And certain engravings provide major clues. The question is whether or not they are all related. And in particular, is the birth of Henry de Vere at the centre of it? So let's start with the reasons to doubt Henry de Vere's parentage. These come in the form of hidden messages in the literature of the time. If you follow the story so far, you'll know that pretty well anything that was written that was contentious had to be done in such a way that the author could defend themselves against libel. The techniques varied from complex ciphers to simple ambiguity. I'm going to give you just some examples of these. If you want a more detailed analysis, 
please watch Alexander Waugh's video, A Fair Youth, A Dark Lady and Shakespeare, The Scandal Exposed. The first comes from the dedication page to the sonnets. You may not be familiar with this analysis, so I will explain it to you. The words of introduction read as follows. To the only begetter of the ensuing sonnets, Mr. W. H., all happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet, wisheth the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth. Signed, T. T. Now that might sound like gobbledygook to you, and indeed many minds have been applied to try and understand it. Alexander Waugh's done a brilliant decryption by extending earlier efforts by John Rollett. Many interesting things have emerged from this, but it's one in particular that concerns us here. If you want to learn more about the others, go to Alexander's YouTube channel. The text contains one of the most complex ciphers ever conceived, and almost certainly was devised by Dr John Dee, who among many other skills was advisor to Queen Elizabeth and a cryptologist. The principle is this. Any text can be aligned in blocks of varying widths. This throws up new alignments of letters, which can be read in any direction or as an anagram. The use of pictograms within the blocks can amplify the effect. The one you're looking at here has a text block 19 letters across. If you read across, you will see the way it's constructed from the text in a single string with no breaks or punctuations. In the centre is a pictogram, an inverted T, the letters of which are an anagram of De Vere. Not too surprising, you might think. Lots of letters to choose from. However, close to it is a collection of letters which spell fourth T with indeed four T's. Now, if you'd seen my earlier presentations, you will know about the concept of personal numbers in Tudor times, which define the closeness to God. Edward de Vere's were 17 and 40. On the left is the symbol known as the triple tau, three letter T's or tau in Greek. It represents the Trinity. Hidden within it is a fourth T. This represents the individual which brings us, of course, to 40s and 40. This arrangement verifies that the spelling of De Vere is not a chance occurrence. So let's put in 4ts, or be in a slightly different format, that of a cross potent or crutch cross, a variant of the Christian cross. The letters of this shape can be arranged into the sentence, heed De Vere's paternity lie. The text does not indicate which de Vere it's referring to, either Edward, the 17th Earl, or his father, John, the 16th Earl. Further over to the right can be constructed another pictogram, St Peter's Cross, which is upside down. This again is verified by the proximity of the four T's. The letters are a perfect anagram of E. Vere's line. So it tells us that we're Edward we're talking about. I'm sure by now you're thinking that if you fiddled around with the letters for long enough, you could come up with all sorts of words which confirm your preconception. Here's an example. If we go back to the cross potent, the highlighted letters are also an anagram of Espy thy eternal via ID. If the letters of the last two words are rearranged, we have ever id. Now id is the abbreviation for the Latin word idem, meaning the same. So we have ever the same. Interestingly, the feminine version is eardem, part of the motto of Elizabeth I, semper eardem, which translates as always the same. If we go back to the two inverted crosses, the letters are a perfect anagram of De Vere never lies, reflecting the family motto, Vero nihil various, nothing truer than truth. Now I'm not saying if either is correct, I'm just making the point that we need to be very careful arriving at a conclusion on the basis of just one analysis. The second example comes from 
Venus and Adonis, and Lucrece. The two long narrative poems, the first of which describes the attempted seduction by the goddess Venus of the mortal Adonis, who goes off hunting and is gored by a boar. The second describes the rape of a friend's wife by a young prince. The issue here is whether or not these are just reworking of Greek myths. Both were dedicated to the young Earl of Southampton, Henry Rosalie, rather odd given the nature of the subject matter, unless, of course, the stories reflect current events. The nature of those dedications reflects a rather complex relationship between the two men, interpreted by most as, inverted commas, love, in any of the ways the term was used in Tudor times. Some would extend this to that between father and son. The third example comes from the sonnets themselves. It's universally accepted that the fair youth of the sonnets was Henry Rosalie, and that to some degree at least the work is autobiographical. The first 17 sonnets are all on the same theme. The poet tells the youth that his beauty will die if he doesn't procreate. The argument is set out in the first two lines, then repeated over and over. This might be interpreted as de Vere getting Henry Rosalie to do something for him. It might equally be related to the attempts by both de Vere and William Cecil to persuade Henry Rosalie to marry Elizabeth de Vere, the daughter of Edward. But then again, it might just be a poetic exercise on narcissism. De Vere tells us in Sonnet 62, Sin of self-love possesseth all mine eye, and all my soul, and all my every part. Quotations from the sonnets appear to support some sort of scandal, and the poet is an outcast. Here are just two of them. Sonnet 29. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I alone beweep my outcast state. Sonnet 112. Your love and pity doth the impression fill which vulgar scandal stamped upon my brow. For what care I who calls me well or ill? The fourth example comes from Willoughby, his visa. At the end of 1594, a book was published with this curious title. It was also called The True Picture of a Modest Maid and of a Chaste and Constant Wife. Everyone agrees this is highly satirical, and it retells the story of Penelope, the wife of Ulysses, who during his absence fends off a series of suitors. In this book, Aviza is a married woman who does just the same for five suitors, the last of whom is Italianesque, with the initials HW, who takes advice from an old player, one WS, who had a previous relationship with Aviza, on how best to seduce her. The author, by the name of Hadrian Dorrell, of whom there is no trace, is very careful not to give enough information to identify the protagonists with certainty, but many have inferred that the initials stand for Henry Rosalie and William Shakespeare. The author Michael Mouton has opined that the book uses the rhetorical device of ironia. In other words, the meaning is the exact opposite of what has been written. Such a device can be switched on and off, for example, by one person speaking. By this analysis, the book is all about a very unfaithful wife. Now, there have been many interpretations of this work in the past, but the complex layers of conflicting elements mean that even today there's no consensus as to its meaning. Some believe a visa is Elizabeth I, and indeed the very fact that it was passed by the censors and withdrawn only in 1599 gives some credence to this. It could be said to show her in a good light, if you ignore the ironia. Others believe that a visa is Penelope Rich, who we will meet shortly. In other words, this is a direct reference to a love triangle between Edward de Vere, Henry Rosalie and Penelope Rich, as described in the sonnets. The frontispiece to the book is of great interest. It is a woodcut by William Rogers, perhaps the finest engraver of his day. It contains a quotation from the Bible. A virtuous woman is the crown of her husband, but she that maketh him ashamed is a corruption in his bones. 
Proverb 12.4. You will note that this text is not straight, indicating that it was not part of the main woodblock, and it certainly doesn't appear when the frontispiece was used in later publications. It shows the figure of Pallas Athena on the left, goddess of the arts, accompanied by her owl, pomegranates and an olive branch. She was often portrayed with a spear, from which the epithet spear shaker was derived, and many have made the connection of the name with that of Shakespeare. On the opposite side is the goddess Artemis, or Diana, complete with a moon-shaped diadem. Both goddesses are holding up a sheet above which is a stag's head, and they are turned away from it. In heraldic terms, the en face display of a head is termed kaboshed. Over the top is a crescent moon, and below it an element which is separate from the main metallic-like frame and which has been likened to the horns of an ox. The head is flanked by two putti, who are also pointing towards the head but averting their eyes. There is debate as to whether they are holding the antlers against the head or just leaning on them. Right at the bottom of the page is an image of the myth of Diana and Actaeon, something which we've come across several times on this journey. For those of you who are new to the story, the hunter Actaeon spies Diana while she's bathing. She's so incensed that she turns him into a stag and his hounds rip him to pieces. This myth was widely known in Tudor times and used by Elizabeth I as a warning to her courtiers as to what fate might befall them if they transgressed her, the exemplar of which was the Grove of Diana at Nonsuch Palace, which I described in an earlier presentation. The possession of ram's horns or antlers was also used to signify a man being cuckolded. The link to the Diana and Actian myth appears to be that the horns or antlers are an outward sign of the man's impotence. At the bottom corners of the picture are rabbits, signs of fertility. Look at the one on the right. Is he looking over his shoulder rather malevolently to the one on the left which looks guilty? It's the only one with the tail pointing downwards. Beside them are what appear to be two of Actian's hunting dogs holding drapery, redolent of entrails. Well, one interpretation is that Athena is Shakespeare, Diana is Penelope Rich, hiding below the sheet, and the stag's head is her husband, Lord Rich, the cuckold. Penelope was referred to as Diana in literature, and particularly Henry Constable's sonnet sequence, Diana, published in 1592. So the moon above the head of the stag may be to signify that it's her husband. There may of course be other explanations linked to the classical interpretation of the myth. For example, the stag is someone who got too close to Elizabeth I for his own good. So these are just some examples of pointers from the literature towards a scandal of some sort. Now look, let's look beyond this into the lives of those who may have been involved. No better place to start than with Edward de Vere. The end of the 1580s was disastrous for him. His wife Anne died in 1588 from a fever and his three daughters, Elizabeth 13, Bridget 4 and Susan 1, were taken into the care of their grandparents, William Cecil and his wife Mildred Cook. Edward de Vere was not considered fit to care for them. To add to this, his finances were in a ruinous state. Indeed, in a botched deal, he ended up giving Headingham Castle to William Cecil and it was put in trust for his children. He received nothing in return. He was still indebted to the court of wards and most of his estate was heavily mortgaged to release funds. In 1588, he sold Vere House, his London base, close to London Stone, in what is now Cannon Street. The stone was thought to be of Roman origin and lived in a niche in the wall below the central window of St Swithin. In the same year he sold Fisher's Folly, a large house just north of Bishopsgate, which he'd bought a decade earlier and was the focus for writing of many of his associates. The purchaser was one William Cornwallis, whose daughter Anne left a copybook of poems and sonnets attributed to Shakespeare, which she may have acquired from the house. 
It appears that he also owned and sold ten acres of land, which stretched to the east as far as the Boar's Head in Altgate. He was no longer able to pay the rent on part of a large property on St Peter's Hill, running down between St Paul's Cathedral and the river. The premises were used for its coterie of writers, some of whom later drifted away, and others were to die shortly afterwards. He was also unable to afford his usual general sponsorship of writers and scholars, and was both pursued for debt and defrauded by trustees. Strangely, in 1590, he appears to have moved to Stoke Newington. This lies three and a half miles north of the theatres in Shoreditch. In the late 16th century, it was a rather small, exclusive community centred around St Mary's Church. In the manor, close by lived John Dudley, and in addition to Edward de Vere, London and foreign merchants either rented or bought houses population was around 200. Details of the residence of Edward de Vere are given in the history of Stoke Newington, in turn quoting John Norden from his 5093 edition of the Mirrors of the British, who describes the Earl of Oxford living in a very proper house, which given his circumstances was probably rented. He was to stay there for seven years. Oxford in love? Well, during 1591, Edward de Vere began courting Elizabeth Trentham, one of the Queen's maids of honour, and indeed in May of that year a poem was published in a pirated edition of love poetry called Britain's Bower of Delights, and it seems likely to have been written by him. The text reads, Time made a stay when highest powers wrought regard of love, where virtue had her grace. Excellent rare of every beauty sought notes of the heart where honour had her place. Tried by the touch of most approved truth, a worthy saint to serve a heavenly queen. More fair than she that was the fame of youth, except but one the like was never seen. The first letters, of course, spell the name Trentame. Cleverly, the poet, while flattering his chosen love, pays homage to the queen. The couple married in November or December of 1591, receiving a wedding gift from the Queen on December the 27th, and they set up home in Stoke Newington. Next, let's take a closer look at Elizabeth Trentham and her family. Elizabeth was the daughter of Thomas Trentham and his wife Jane Snaid. Following the dissolution of the monasteries, Rochester Abbey in Staffordshire and its lands were bought by Elizabeth's grandfather, Richard the MP for Shropshire. The abbey was dismantled and a manor house built on the site. The Snade family made their money practising law in Chester and then rapidly became one of the wealthiest landowners in Staffordshire. The Trentham family made their fortune in the drapery business and townhouses in Shrewsbury and had little experience in land management. The joining of the two families made for great profitability by extensive land improvement, thereby attracting higher rents from tenant farmers. The Trentham family lived in Rochester, the Snades in Keele. Both families had a connection with the royal court. Thomas Trentham was Sheriff of Staffordshire and sat as a Shire Knight in the House of Commons. In 1586 he was appointed to the Privy Council to accompany Mary, Queen of Scots, to her trial in Fotheringay Castle. Elizabeth had five brothers and sisters, but only one is of interest to us, Francis, who, as we shall see, was a very shrewd businessman. Sadly, I can find no image of Elizabeth Trentham. She was born around 1562, and it has been suggested by Josiah Wedgwood that the Queen was her godmother. There's no doubt that the Queen held her in high regard, as is evidenced by the Queen's tone in the salutation of a licensing document in 1596 to our well-beloved cousin Elizabeth, Countess of Oxenford, wife of Edward, Earl of Oxenford, and to our beloved Francis Trentham, Esquire. Elizabeth was for ten years one of the Queen's maids of honour. She would have had a good education, able to speak both French and Italian, and fluent in the courtly arts of music, dance and poetry. 
these ladies, usually young, created an image of sophistication, beauty and formality. On the 5th of April 1582, J. Farnham wrote to Roger Manners, Earl of Rutland, Miss Trentham is as fair as ever, Mistress Edgecombe as modest, Mistress Radcliffe as comely, and Mistress Garrett as jolly as ever. In 1593, Thomas Churchard offered a description of her in a publication entitled A Pleasant Conceit, penned in verse, in which he eulogised the countesses of various towns. Here is the text. Oxford came last like sober Sibyl sage, whose modest face like fair Lucina shone, whose staid looks decors her youthful age, that glisters like the alabaster stone, her blotless life much lord and glory gate, and called her up to be a great estate. The diamond doth lose his dainty light, and waxen dim when Oxford comes in sight. The interesting thing here is that he likens her to Lucina. This was an epithet given to Juno, the Roman goddess of light, childbirth and married love. He also comments on her staid looks, older but still youthful. In 1599, an anonymous book was published entitled The First Book of the Preservation of King Henry VII when he was but the Earl of Richmond, in which the following section appears. And God grant to the Earl of Oxford, mirror of highness, happiness in this world. God bless his lady, the Countess Elizabeth Trentham, that right true maiden of honour, immaculate virgin whose house and name I do favour with reverence, as I should, for I came myself of a Trentum. The description of Elizabeth Trentum as Immaculate Virgin could indicate that she got a child without going through the usual process. However, the author is referring to her under her maiden name. So the text could also mean that she was a virgin before she was married. I found an unsupported reference to Elizabeth knowing Edward de Vere for the entire time she was in court. Not surprising, really. But what convinced her to marry him? Curiously, the Queen raised no objection, which was unusual as many in the past had found themselves in prison for marrying one of her staff. I suspect the reasons were complicated, but suited both sides equally. Edward de Vere was around 41, and Elizabeth was around 30. He was virtually destitute, lonely if not depressed, lame and hardly a good catch. The Trentons would gain status. Being Countess of Oxford and married to the Queen's most senior courtier was a big step up. I suspect that the Queen encouraged her to do it. She must have been aware of his predicament and his need for help. Beside Elizabeth Trentham stood Francis, her brother, he stood to gain increased access to the court by the marriage, enhancing his financial position. Next, there was a state acquisition. Along with his uncle, Ralph Snade, he seemed prepared to invest large amounts of Trent and family wealth to secure the future of the De Vere estate for his sister and her new family. Then, of course, there was Legacy, a possible earl in the family. From Edward de Vere's point of view, he would get financial and domestic security, a possible son and heir. And what about love? Well, now there's a question. Here are some examples of the involvement of Elizabeth's brother, which I think are quite revealing. In March of 1592, a licence was granted to Edward de Vere and Elizabeth to transfer ownership of land in the village of Belcham Water, now known as Belcham Walter, close to Headingham, to Francis Trentham and Ralph Snade. Now, was this just a manoeuvre to avoid Oxford's creditors? In 2007, the researcher Jeremy Crick discovered an undated, handwritten note by one G. E. Cockaine, the Victorian author of The Complete Peerage and The Complete Baronetage. It reads in part, Francis Trentham of Rochester, Esquire, was sheriff for Stafford. His sister, Elizabeth Trentham, one of Elizabeth's maids of honour, was second wife to Edward de Vere of Oxford, 
to whom this Francis advanced £10,000 on the Earl agreeing that failing his own male deleted issue by the second wife, the said Francis and his heirs would succeed to Headingham Castle and other estates in Essex. The deletion of mail would seem to indicate that there was some last-minute bartering based on the realisation that a male offspring was not guaranteed. It is, however, still an extraordinary statement, made even more so as Edward de Vere had given away the castle in trust to his daughters. On the 2nd of September 1597, the Queen granted licence to the executors of Sir Rowland Haywood to sell King's Place in Hackney in North London to Elizabeth Trentham, her brother Francis Trentham, her uncle Ralph Snade and her cousin Giles Young. The acquisition of King's Place by Elizabeth Trentham and her relatives was said to place it beyond the reach of Oxford's creditors, but it also, of course, put it into their own hands. The house was valued at £3,500. King's Place was a substantial country manor house with a celebrated great hall, a classic Tudor long gallery, a chapel and a proper library to lay books in. The land comprised orchards and fine gardens and some 270 acres of farmland. There was a sting in the tail to all of this. In 1609, Francis provided his sister Elizabeth, now Dowager Countess of Oxford, with £10,000 to help purchase part of the ancient Vere estates, including Headingham Castle. In return, Elizabeth settled the reversion on Trentham and its heirs. Consequently, as the 18th Earl of Oxford dialed childless in 1625, the property came to Trentham's great-granddaughter after the death of Oxford's widow, Lady Diana Cecil, in 1654. That could possibly be game over, I think. To complete the picture of Elizabeth Trentham, she remained on good terms with the Queen following her marriage, and six months before her death in 1613 entertained King James and his retinue. She remained forthright and independent, as is supported by correspondence and her will. From what I've told you, I think you can realise that Elizabeth Trentham was no pushover. This was an emotional and business takeover of Edward de Vere by the Trentums. But was it for love? Who knows? What about those ten years in service with the Queen? Were there any suitors? To those questions, we simply do not know the answers. With all this background, let's, now let's take a look at the facts about the birth of Henry de Vere. He was born on the 24th of February, 1593, at St Mary, Stoke Newington. The pregnancy calculator assumes gestation is 40 weeks from the first day of the last period. Conception would then have taken place around two weeks later. Working backwards, this means that the Countess of Oxford would have fallen pregnant around June 1st, 1592, about six months after the wedding. What could be more natural? Perhaps if they'd been married for ten years without an heir and then one turned up, tongues might start wagging. Or perhaps if Edward de Vere was known to be incapable of siring a child, something that I think is highly unlikely, given that his youngest daughter Susan was born in May 1587, just five years earlier. So what are the possible scenarios concerning the birth of Edward de Vere? Well, there are five simple ones. Henry de Vere was the natural child of Edward and Elizabeth. Edward de Vere had a mistress who gave birth to a son who was then brought up by Lady Oxford. The Countess had an extramarital liaison leading to pregnancy. Edward de Vere convinced someone to sire a son for him. Or someone close had an affair with a lady in a prominent position and the child was taken in by the Veres as their own. Let's look at them in turn. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, I can find no images of Elizabeth Trentham, but her sister Catherine has kindly agreed to take part in this exercise. Scenario 1. All is well in the world. We're having a baby, and we hope it's a boy. Scenario 2. My mistress is pregnant theory. 
This seems highly unlikely to me. Such a mistress would surely be left to fend for herself, as happened with Anne Vavasor. In addition, I can't imagine the new Countess of Oxford taking too kindly to this outcome. In a sense, she held all of the cards, and indeed the money. Scenario 3. I'm pregnant by another man. Can we keep the child? This again seems very unlikely. Here is a woman of over 30 who's never been married before. Would she really risk all that she'd gained? However, a case has been made for just this scenario. John Hamill, writing in the Shakespeare Oxford newsletter of 2005, argues that Elizabeth had an affair with Henry Rosalie and she was the dark lady of the sonnets and she was also a visa. Several years later, John Hamill changed his mind to argue that Penelope Rich was the mother of Henry de Vere. Scenario 4. I need a son in a hurry, so go and make one for me. This again seems very unlikely. Why would the Countess agree to such a thing when married for only six months and the possibility of a child of her own? It's hard to imagine finding a couple who would willingly carry out the task. And what if the child had turned out to be a girl? He had three of those already. Would the Countess of Oxford have been expected to walk around with a pillow tucked up her dress with only a 50% chance that the outcome would be a boy? Scenario 5. I've got someone pregnant. Can you help? Now this possibility needs careful evaluation as it does help explain some of the reasons for doubt which I explained at the start. The two people in the frame for this are Henry Rosalie, who would have been 19 in 1592, and Penelope Rich, who would have been 29. A liaison between these two is consistent with the theme of the sonnets, the love triangle between Henry de Vere, Rosalie and the so-called Dark Lady, in this case Penelope Rich. It would also go some way to explain Willoughby his avisa, Penelope being the unfaithful married protagonist who had a string of lovers, one of whom was Edward de Vere. Once again, it's hard to understand how the Countess would have wanted to take on such a responsibility. It was Henry Rosalie and Penelope Rich's problem. They should sort it out. The issue here is whether or not there was an opportunity for such a scenario. For that, we need to know what they were up to around 1592. But first, let's learn some more about Penelope Rich. Many books and articles have been written about her. For those who are not familiar with her, here's a brief history. Penelope was born in 1563, the daughter of Walter Devereux, 1st Earl of Essex, and the brother of Robert Devereux, later 2nd Earl. Following her father's death, according to his wishes, she spent four years under the strict regime of Catherine Hastings, Countess of Huntingdon, who was the sister to her stepfather, Robert Dudley. She was married in 1581, aged 18, against her will, to Robert, 3rd Lord Rich and 1st Earl of Warwick, a strict Puritan with an unpleasant temper. She was the subject of a sonnet sequence entitled Astrophel, Star Lover and Stella, Star, written by Sir Philip Sidney, poet, diplomat and soldier. The extent of their physical relationship remains uncertain, but occurred after she was married. Sir Philip died in 1586, and the sonnets were published formally in 1596. Penelope became a patroness of literature, not least when it became known that she was Stella. At least 11 authors dedicated works to her. She bore Lord Rich five children, and while remaining married, bore another six to Charles Blunt, whom we'll meet shortly. Penelope divided her time between her family home, Chartley Manor, in Staffordshire, and Lees Castle, in Essex, shown here, and of course the Royal Court. She used her brother's property on the Strand, called Essex House, as her base, and was allowed considerable freedom to entertain there, including people such as Henry Rosalie. She had her own apartment, it had a splendid bed in black, gold and silver with a black canopy and bed curtains. Sylvia Friedman, the authoress, calls it a lover's bed rather than a matrimonial one. Even the chairs and stools were black velvet with gilt frames. 
She was known to be beautiful, vivacious and self-confident. The consummate socialite, who regularly attended the Christmas revels at the inns of court and with her brother hosted lavish parties, banquets and theatrical entertainments. When she travelled, she was often accompanied on her journeys by a group of ladies who acted as a counterweight to her husband's dreary friends. Although deeply involved in the Essex Rebellion, she escaped punishment. Now let's home in on the events in her life around the time of Henry Vere's birth. On the 17th of November, 1590, at the Accession Day Tournament, Sir Charles Blunt, dressed in blue and gold, rode out wearing Lady Rich's colours. The poet George Peel described the occasion thus. Come Sir Charles Blunt, rich in his colours, rich in his thoughts, rich in his fortune, honour, arms and art. Precisely when the affair began is uncertain, but this was the first occasion when it was openly expressed. Lord Rich was prepared to accept the situation in order to maintain his links with Penelope's brother, Robert. So these are the children of Robert Rich. Latisse, Essex, a girl, Robert, Elizabeth and Henry, who was born in August of 1590. There was then a clean break before Blunt's children appeared on the scene. And here they are. The first was Penelope, whose surname was changed from Rich to Blunt some years later. Originally, her birth year was recorded as 1589, based on her age of death. The author, Sylvia Friedman, found the original baptism entry as the 30th of March 1592 at St Clement's Danes Church. The likely explanation was that her age at marriage was exaggerated in order to inherit her father's estate. Given that Penelope's previous daughter had died soon after birth, it's likely that the baptism was held quickly. The birth was likely to have been at Essex House, just opposite the church. In June of 1592, Penelope visited her mother at Chartley. This was something she did each year, spending part of the summer back in the countryside. So how does this fit with the birth of Henry de Vere? Now here are the representation of the calendars for 1591, 1592 and 1593. Don't be daunted, there is no need to worry about when the years ended and began, or indeed the days. All we're interested in here are the weeks. This is an enlargement of the area of interest, January to June of 1592. The yellow areas represent the last trimester of the pregnancy of Penelope Rich's daughter, Penelope Blunt. We know she was baptised on the 31st of March and let's assume that she was born two weeks earlier on the 16th. The brown area is the beginning of the pregnancy of Henry de Vere, arrived at by calculating back from his birth date. The blocks in red show the intervening weeks between the two dates and this amounts to 11 weeks or 77 days. Now we can assume that Penelope did not breastfeed along with all other noble women of her time. An article in Obstetrics and Gynaecology from 2011 by Jackson and Glazier concluded that most breastfeeding mothers will not ovulate until after six weeks postpartum. A study using changes of temperature to indicate ovulation showed that the mean day of ovulation was 74 days postpartum. So it's possible that Penelope Rich was the mother of Edward de Vere, but the time frame is very tight, at the most just one cycle. By the end of June, she was off to visit her mother for the summer. John Hamill, in his argument for Penelope, being the mother of Henry de Vere, says that she was not on public view from autumn of 1592 until June of 1593, and that she was absent from court in Christmas 1592. I've searched the court records for this period, and there is no mention of her during this time. Neither is there reference in the biographies of her, but there are many quite large gaps in the accounts of her life and the fact she was not mentioned at court does not equate to her not being there. Her children, of course, were at Lee's Castle. I'm very happy to be corrected on this point if anyone has any positive evidence. 
The accounts I've read give the impression that she was very devoted to her children and indeed to her lover Charles Blunt, and Penelope was his first child by her. Young Penelope was later to go and live at Lees, but the implication from the biographies is that she stayed with her mother during the early months and travelled with her. The other issue is the whereabouts of Charles Blunt. Lord Rich would have accepted a pregnancy as par for the course. Charles Blunt would have considered a pregnancy to be his, unless, of course, he was absent at the time of conception. Once Penelope knew she was mistakenly pregnant, she would surely have called him back for an urgent liaison. If it were planned, she would have to conceal the pregnancy and indeed stay out of sight to avoid wagging tons. Unfortunately, Charles Blunt's movements are not quite as well documented as Elizabeth's. However, some details are available which help to locate him. He began his military career in the Netherlands in 1585 under Sir John Norris. He was with Philip Sidney when he received his fatal wound at Zutphen in 1586 and was knighted by Leicester after the battle for Flushing. For several years after the 1588 Armada, the Queen strove to keep him at court and besides his regular pay, she awarded him £400 in 1592. In June that year, Sir John Norris undertook to support Henri of Navarre by defending Brittany against the Spanish. The army set sail in November and suffered a disastrous winter. Norris was stuck on a foreign shore in charge of a largely ill-equipped, undisciplined and inexperienced army. He left for England dissatisfied in February 1593 and he returned again in September of the same year. So why is this important? Well, here is an extract from the State Papers from December of 1593 reviewing the cost of troops in Brittany. You can see that Sir Charles Blunt was with them from the 15th of January 1593. It's reasonable to conclude that he was present in England during the preparatory phase from June of 1592. In other words, for the first six months of the pregnancy of Henry de Vere. Here is the court record for April the 13th, 1593. Sir Charles Blount at court had been recalled from Brittany without the Queen's leave. She sent a messenger to him with a strict charge to the general to send him home. She is quoted as saying, you will go when I send you. In the meantime, see that you lodge in the court. The date on which the message was sent is not recorded. Now the history of Parliament tells us this. Between his campaigns, Blunt was returned to three parliaments. He represented Beer Alston in Devon in 1586 and 1593. The only mention found of his participating in the business of the House is his membership of a large committee appointed to take the Commons answer to the Lords on 3rd of March 1593 to the effect that it was against the privileges of the Commons to have a conference with the Lords over a subsidy. On the 23rd of March and the 2nd of April, the Burgesses of Devon constituencies, of which he was one, were appointed to committees concerning curses, a type of cloth. This date does not appear to be an error, as the records are corrected for New Year's Day being January the 1st, it would seem to indicate that he was back in the country some time prior to being seen by the Queen, and this is in keeping with the return of Sir John Norris in February. In summary, then, he was seen by the Queen on the 13th of April. He was reported as present in Parliament on the 3rd of March, just 10 days after the birth of Henry de Vere, and he was definitely in Brittany on the 15th of January. He was therefore not in the country for the last few weeks of pregnancy and the birth of Henry de Vere on the 24th of February. However, Penelope would still be showing signs of recent pregnancy if he'd been back in the country on the 3rd of March. Charles Blunt remained for 15 years the paramour of Penelope Rich. Following the death of her brother Robert Devereux, her husband Robert Rich divorced her and she married Lord Mountjoy much to the annoyance of James I. Mountjoy died just six months later 
and Penelope fell from favour. After his death, a quite extraordinary reference to her was published. In 1606, the poet John Ford published a prefatory poem in a book called Fame's Memorial, an elegy on the death of Lord Mountjoy. Here is the poem. For our purposes, pay attention only to the capital letters. These are highlighted in blue and spell out the sentence Penelope Countess of Devonshire, Koitui. Now, Koitui is Latin and it's the dative case of coitus, the Latin word for sex, which translates as available for sex. This seems an extraordinary statement to make to the widow of a man that you're writing about. However, John Ford blamed her for the fall from grace of Lord Mountjoy by marrying him. This has been read as a general statement on Penelope's morality, or alternatively, just that she was back on the market at the age of 42. What about Henry Rosalie? Well, Henry was born on the 6th of October, 1573. At the time of Henry de Vere's conception, he was 19 and a half. On the 26th of June, 1592, Henry wrote to Michael Hicks to ask for his help in convincing Lord Burley to rectify the damage to his estates due to neglect during his wardship. So, just three weeks after the conception of Henry de Vere, Henry Rosalie writes a letter from his lodgings in the Strand, the same street as Essex House where Penelope Rich had her apartment. If he was attending court, he would also have known Elizabeth Trentham, although by this stage she was living a fair distance away. Henry Rosely was in the right place at the right time to have sired Henry de Vere. He certainly had a reputation for promiscuity. Now I'd like to look at this from a different angle. I mentioned at the beginning that there were some important engravings in this story. Much has been made about the name Henry being given to the 18th Earl of Oxford. It has been taken to signify the link between Edward de Vere and Henry Rosalie. To be fair, the name Edward had already been taken by Edward de Vere's eldest son. In the second decade of the 17th century, Henry de Vere has been portrayed as being very close to Henry Rosalie. So are they related? In other words, father and son. Here they are in an engraving, which was probably done after 1625, when both men were dead. Henry de Vere is on the left, Henry Rosely on the right. This is of great interest for a number of reasons, not least of which is the fact that the heads are transposed on two earlier historical figures who were in a military alliance. The position of the hand is very unusual, suggesting some sort of pact between the two men who give the appearance of having been interrupted while privately discussing something of gravity. They are looking you straight in the eye, in a rather suspicious way. The other important detail is the name De Vere, hinting at the origin of the Veres from the town of Vere in the Netherlands, and the pact had something to do with this. Alexander Waugh provides a compelling explanation of the engraving in his video The Two Henrys, which is well worthwhile watching. If you look at the faces close up, I think you can see quite clearly that de Vere has a fuller face and a much broader, straighter nose. On the right is a painting of Henry de Vere aged around 30, and there are clear facial similarities. Henry Rosely on the right is shown aged around 45. Once again, the engraving captures the facial features well. Comparison of facial features to detect a relationship is fraught with difficulties, but I have added my usual dot map and grid from De Vere to Henry Rosely. In fact, the geometry of the eyes, face and mouth are very similar. Fortunately for our investigation, Alexander Waugh has described something very interesting. On the left is an engraving of Henry Rosely held in the Royal Collection. It was carried out by Simon van der Pass in 1617. On the right is an engraving of Henry de Vere by Robert Vaughan, an expert in heraldry, and it was done between 1619 and 1622. 
It depicts a trim figure, which apart from the convex nose, bears little resemblance to what he really looked like. He does, however, bear a striking resemblance to the young Earl of Southampton, in particular the downy cheek, the lovelock of hair on his left, and the earring. Vaughan has copied many elements of the van der Pass engraving, including the style of the frame and the text below it. Both figures carry a marshal's baton, but Henry de Vere's is shown in its entirety, diagonally across his chest. In heraldry, there's an item called a baton sinister. This is a charge, i.e. it appears within the shield of the coat of arms, in this case diagonally, and signifies bastardy. Now you can see the de Vere coat of arms at the top of the engraving. A representation of the baton sinister for the de Vere family would look something like this. Now if we imagine the torso of the Earl to be a shield and then make it transparent, you can see how the baton sits with a star in the first quarter. And if you enlarge the underlying image, there is a star on his tunic in just this place. This graving was apparently extremely rare, not surprisingly really, given his uh, implications. So I think you'll agree that there is very strong evidence of Henry Rosalie being the father of Henry de Vere. The issue is the identity of his mother. Circumstantial evidence from analysis of contemporary literature would seem to favour Penelope Rich as both mother and the dark lady. However, there are several arguments against this derived from contemporary events. Firstly, in the event of an unplanned pregnancy between Henry Rosalie and Penelope Rich, there would have been no need to conceal it or give away the child. It could easily have been passed off as Charles Blunt's. The records indicate that he was in England until late 1592, by which time Penelope would have been in the last trimester of pregnancy. Secondly, a planned pregnancy between Henry Rosalie and Penelope Rich to provide a son for Edward de Vere seems highly unlikely and indeed risky. There was no guarantee of a son and the discovery would have ruined Penelope's relationship with Charles Blunt, who by all accounts was devoted to her. It's hard to imagine that the Countess of Oxford would have agreed to take on such a child. It is true that there was pressure to produce an heir, but the pregnancy occurred only six months after the marriage. The sonnets tell us that the poet was displeased with the fair uh, youth and angry with the dark lady for their relationship, which does not really fit with this scenario. Thirdly, there were only 11 weeks between the birth of Penelope's natural daughter Penelope and the onset of another pregnancy. To conceive during this time is rare. Fourthly, concealing a pregnancy in the presence in London of Charles Blunt would have required an extraordinary feat of deception, made more so by the fact that young Penelope was his first child. He would surely have wanted to see her. Well, it seems to me that we're left with two possibilities for the parentage of Henry de Vere. First, the safe option, Edward de Vere and his wife Elizabeth Trentham. Penelope Rich could still have been the dark lady of the love triangle, but surely given Edward de Vere's previous indiscretions, this alone would not have caused a large scandal. The other possibility is a liaison between Henry Rosalie and Elizabeth Trentham, setting her up as the dark lady. This might fit with what we've learned about the relationship between the Trentums and Edward de Vere more of a mutually convenient financial and social pact than a true love match. Elizabeth Trenton, being the dark lady, also chimes with the subject of Edward de Vere's poem Lucrece, in which the young prince rapes a friend's wife, and indeed the tale of Venus Adonis, where the older goddess attempts to seduce a young mortal. Could Edward de Vere have persuaded Henry Rosely to impregnate his wife? The only possible reason for this would be one of impotence, something which was unlikely given the birth of Susan de Vere only a few years before. If it were planned, then it would have turned out to have been extraordinarily successful, but it runs contrary to what the sonnets tell us. Given his reputation, I reckon that young Henry Rosalie got himself and everyone else into trouble. <laughs>
So how would the frontispiece of Willoughby's His Aviza be interpreted in this scenario? Well, the stag would be Edward de Vere, who'd been cuckolded, complete with antlers. The crescent moon could signify horns, which are more usually associated with cuckoldry. And below the head are stylized ox's horns. Pallas Athena, goddess of arts, could represent the artistic community, appalled by what has taken place, and Diana is Elizabeth I, shocked and distancing herself from events. What does not fit is the backstory to Willoughby Hisavisa, in other words, the five suitors. Two could be taken as Henry Rosalie and Edward de Vere, but that leaves three more. Having said that, we know nothing of the ten years Elizabeth Trentham spent in the Queen's service. As she was attractive, then surely there would have been suitors. I hope you've enjoyed this very interesting story. Once again, I'm trying to stimulate thought and discussion by approaching problems from a new perspective. I don't think we should write off Elizabeth Trentham as the mother of Henry de Vere. It seems to me, from my research, that there was much more to the marriage than a love match. The Trentons, if you like, had an agenda. It's also possible that Edward de Vere had a relationship with her for some time prior to marriage. As I discussed in an earlier presentation, there always remains the possibility that Henry Rosely was the child of Elizabeth I and Edward de Vere. Under these circumstances, the scandal would have been greatly amplified, although strangely, Henry de Vere could still have been eligible to be Earl of Oxford, being the grandson of the 17th Earl, perhaps a good enough reason to raise him as such. The embarrassment of the behaviour of Henry Rosalie may have led to his being out of favour with the Queen for the rest of her life, and one reason she would be unwilling to name him as a successor. We will never know exactly what happened, but the scale of a scandal of Edward de Vere being cuckolded as well as having his finances taken over would have been devastating and may have contributed to his metamorphosis into William Shakespeare as a means of escape. As always, thank you very much for watching.